Hey there, fellow Sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, the Mona Lisa gets caked, a tennis match gets disrupted for the sake of the planet, or something, and we discuss the art of protest and the need for compromise. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your protester today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So as you may or may not know, one of, if not the most, well-known and renowned work of art got an attempted makeover recently. No way! <laughs> no way! Yes, a man dressed as an elderly woman in a wheelchair threw cake on bulletproof glass because… the planet. First of all, art and cake do not mix. Cake belongs exclusively in the realm of aperture science. If you watch this and you got that reference, we should be best friends. But that was not the only recent stunt on behalf of the planet. At the French Open, a climate protester attached herself to the net wearing a shirt ominously claiming that we only have a thousand twenty-eight days left until the next Summer Olympics. God help us. I'm kidding. It's a thousand twenty-eight days left until George R. R. Martin's release of The Winds of Winter. It's good to know, but I'm not sure if it's worth getting arrested over. Anyway, this cake is so delicious and moist. Now, as Christians, we want to affect change too, and that might at times involve protests or civil disobedience. And so the real question that I want to look at is what is an effective way to protest that produces change? Do these kinds of stunts even work? Does throwing cake at a priceless piece of art work? The thought leaders of The View address this issue. Will this do anything to bring attention to that issue? <coughs> Maybe. No, it's asinine. Look, we're talking about the fact that he smeared, that he d defaced the Mona Lisa. I mean, it's bulletproof protected, but we're talking about... Because someone else did the same thing, right. tried to so they, ruin... They Why are you ruining it? the art? I mean, it's a priceless work of art. He so didn't how is that protest it was going to... A, he didn't touch the... No, no, no. no but, but he was trying. He was, trying he was to. pounding on it first. And, the, and I don't understand oh. how we're talking about that as opposed to the cause. So I think those kinds of stunts, like he wore a wig and he dressed up as, a, as an elderly woman in a wheelchair to smuggle it in, I, we're talking about that as opposed to what the issue is that he's actually protesting. So I think that stunts like that don't work at all. I it's think they work. I, do too. I mean, we're talking about it. We're not no, talking we're about talking climate about change. It. We're talking yeah, about it. Yeah. I, I, I think climate change is something that we we ignore so much in not only in this country but around the world, um, and. Obviously, we're, we're talking about this issue. The Mona Lisa is about this big, I, I learned when I went to the Louvre, yeah. and it also is in this in this case. Yeah, it's but this it's, big, yeah. and it's somebody it's else's tiny. art. Yeah. But it's, but and it's, how dare you try to destroy yeah. but somebody you, else's art? I don't art. think it can be destroyed, because well, again, it it's in this bullet, bulletproof thing, and he threw some it, whipped cream at it. It wasn't always like It that. wasn't uh, always. The but reason it's, it's behind it, it is because someone else came up and did something right. to it which yeah. needed the Louvre to take it and protect it. Listen, when I, was there, I, I, I totally that. get protest. I dig it. I don't think it's okay to destroy somebody else's art yeah. I don't th in order to make your point. And he should I, I don't be with Greta it's... Thunberg. Like, she does a lot more yeah. with her platform and what you could effectuate change, because I would argue there are two issues here. There's the desire for infamy and attention and stunting, which... He did achieve. Clearly. We're talking about it right now. Clearly. But I don't think he drew special attention to climate change no. by vandalizing or attempting to a major work of art. Now, what's interesting here is that all of these ladies are ostensibly 100% down with the cause. But aside from Sonny, they deeply disliked the stunt. So if your protest turns off even your own supporters, it's probably not very effective. Which then is our first lesson. An effective protest has to be clearly connected to what it is you're protesting. This stunt is mostly just confusing. What on earth does throwing a cake at a pre-industrial revolution painting have to do with climate change? If you're lying down on the tracks of NASCAR? I get it, okay, but tennis? Now, I do understand that they're just looking for eyeballs, but that can't be the entire extent of it. Which leads us to our second point. That awareness campaigns are less effective if there's no action step. We have a thousand twenty-eight days left. And? So should I retire? Or recycle? Or write to my congressman? Are you just a countdown clock? Because that's a lot of t-shirts. You need more than just awareness, you need action steps. 
How would you even know if your protest worked unless you have goals? It has to be attached to something concrete, to an actual goal. Like when I protested to get Morbius back into theaters. I knew I had succeeded when Morbius went back into theaters and I was banned from all tennis matches. Win-win. But I think that the climate issue is illustrative because in many ways Christians should be fairly sympathetic to the cause. Under the Christian worldview, we believe that God has entrusted the earth and all that is in it to our care. We are the caretakers of it, and we are called to be good stewards of it. Now, of course, Christians may debate the exact degree to which man-caused carbon emission is impacting the climate. We may also certainly debate the best way to combat it. Just because you may be against a carbon tax doesn't mean you're against carbon reduction, for instance. We may debate the degree to which climate change can be mitigated. We can debate the efficacy of renewable energy. There's all kinds of debate, but in principle, Christians aren't against doing well by the planet. We want clean air and clean water, and in practical terms, it was really striking how much better the air quality was during COVID lockdown in places like Los Angeles. I like cleaner air, don't you? And maybe electric vehicles are a part of the answer there. Now, we can get into all the details and nuances of climate change maybe on another episode, but again, my point is to think about effective protests. Christians are certainly no antagonists to environmentalism in principle, so why is it that many Christians are put off by climate change advocates? If we're going to be effective advocates, we need to internalize our answer to this. On The View, Greta Thunberg was highlighted as an effective climate activist, so let's take a listen to her. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school, on the other side of the ocean. Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? How dare you is a somewhat less inspirational message than, say, I have a dream. And I'll be honest, even though I know better as a Christian, listening to a spoiled, vain, know-nothing child scold me about my wickedness on the planet makes me less likely to alter my carbon lifestyle and more likely to throw her in a wood chipper. A battery-powered wood chipper. I'm not a monster. Terrible joke. I'm kidding. But we as Christians need to internalize this. No one likes a judgmental scold, and yelling that people are evil is unlikely to produce the changes that we desire. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't hard words that need to be spoken or difficult truths that need to be articulated, but there's better and worse ways of doing that. Contrast the protests during the National Anthem and the Civil Rights Movement. Sports teams refused to come out during the National Anthem. Athletes took knees in defiance of our flag. These protests are directed at our national symbols, the things that we are supposed to rally behind, that we're supposed to unify us. It's a clear repudiation of our nation. As Colin Kaepernick put it, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. America is bad. America is racist. America is evil. That's not a winning message for Americans. Now, contrast that with the more successful protests in the civil rights movement in the 60s. Rather than besmirch the flag, they draped themselves in it, marched with it. It's still advocating for change, still speaking hard truths, but it's contextualized as being for love of their country, not hate. That's a different thing. It's a different thing to say, I love my country, but my country is not living up to its principles or ideals. That's aspirational and inspirational, not antagonistic and combative and it's more effective. And speaking of national anthem protests, the San Francisco Giants manager recently stated that he is not okay with the state of this country and that he won't be coming out for the national anthem until he feels better about the direction of our country. Like most of you, when I heard that, that shook me to my core. The only reason I tune into the game is to watch the managers during the national anthem. What am I gonna watch now? Baseball? Which brings up another point. If no one would ever notice your protests unless you announce it, it's not a great protest. But let's get back to climate. Recently, the European Commission presented a draft proposal that set a EU-wide minimum tax rate for aviation fuels. But surprise, it excludes corporate jets. Which makes sense, because how else are they going to get to the climate summits? 
Which is another lesson for us. Hypocrisy kills any movement. If we want to be effective agents of change, we can't be hypocrites. And finally, the last lesson that we can derive from climate activists is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We can be so fanatically pure that we reject incrementalism and compromise even if it's on the way toward our goal. The climate movement is often rejected because its advocates offer one and only one solution to the problem. And that solution usually involves centralized government, economic suicide, and energy pipe dreams. So for instance, in California, Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order requiring all new cars sold in the state to be zero emission vehicles by 2035. Which is fantastic. As Captain Planet always said, the best thing for the Earth is tens of millions of giant, giant batteries. But batteries are highly recyclable, like plastic bags or straws. So doing this into a blue bin was apparently too difficult for us, but I'm sure we'll all probably handle and recycle tens of millions of giant, giant batteries. Now, I like electric vehicles all right, they're kind of neat, but it's not a silver bullet for anything. The manufacturing of giant, giant batteries creates a lot of CO2 emissions, not to mention the fact that you have to charge those giant, giant batteries. It's got to be plugged in somewhere. Where is that power coming from? Solar! I like solar, I have solar, but let's be real, green energy sources are unreliable and insufficient to meet our energy needs. Currently in California, we do not have enough power to meet demand. We've all experienced the rolling blackouts, and a portion of California's power is being provided by other states. But I'm sure that adding tens of millions of giant, giant batteries to the grid will work just fine. We have solar panels. The only thing that can possibly stop us from achieving climate utopia is lack of willpower and possibly a cloudy day. See, it's hard to take a cause seriously if there's not a serious solution. And any serious solution to meet the energy needs and reduce CO2 is flat out rejected by the environmentalists. Solar, wind, hydro, fine, but what about natural gas? Natural gas produces about 30% less CO2 than oil and 45% less than coal. Plus, natural gas doesn't produce ash particles like coal and oil do, which adds to air pollution. The climate activists say no. California plans to end fracking in 2024 and has denied permits in the interim. No natural gas for you. All right, well, what about nuclear? Nuclear fission does not produce any CO2. Well, there you go. Let's just do that. Environmentalists say no. California is set to close its last nuclear plant in 2025. So our tens of millions of giant, giant batteries are just going to have to be charged by solar. You see how the perfect becomes the enemy of the good? And that's a lesson I think we need to see as we try to affect change as Christians. You do have to create coalitions, and incrementalism is often necessary to reach your actual goal. All right, we'll stop there today. As usual, like, subscribe, share, and review if you like what we're doing here. You can follow me on the major socials. Be sure to join my author's Facebook page. That's going to be pretty important to do as we have some changes coming to ATC this summer. But I'll reveal all of that in due time. But in the meantime, I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Thank you.